that map on one of them. That never happens. I still understand this. Uh, any questions about stuff before we continue? No, we're done, bro. Will you be in your office? Yes. It'll be after 10.30 because I do it at the desk. Yeah, I'll be in your office today. Yes, I'll be there from 12 to about 4. I have a meeting at 4 or a little after 4 I have to go to. Okay. All right. So we've talked about hypothesis testing for poor proportions, and we started talking about it for means. Uh, the example we did last time was if we had a large sample or we had the variance given to us. And I think we had the variance given to us in that example that we did last time, right? Yeah. In either case, though, we would still use the Z value because the variance was given to us. In this case, this is 7.2-4. We do not have the variance given to us in this case. So instead of using a Z value, what do you think we'll use? A T value, good. All right, so there's 10 items in the sample. I'm going to need to know what the mean is of the sample. So we'll do the average here. Oops. Got mad at me because I didn't put two periods in there. There we go. So there was the mean. The 7.55 is the mean. And we also need to know the standard deviation of the sample. So I'm just going to use the, instead of having to take the square root, I'm just going to go ahead and use the standard deviation function for Excel here. So, I hit the equal sign instead of what I was not thinking what I was doing when I was typing. All right, so we'll need those two statistics to help us calculate our test statistic. And we'll need to know one more thing. I need to know the T value with the appropriate degrees of freedom and the appropriate alpha value, which we haven't mentioned yet. So in this particular problem, it's asking us to test at a 95% confidence. Okay, so our 95% confidence will do the nine, uh, the T dot uh, inverse, right? It's a one-tailed test. Let's nope. It says it's a, this one. This pro particular problem says a two-sided alternative hypothesis. So I'm going to use 0.975. Okay. And how many degrees of freedom will we use in this case? Nine. Nine. Nine? Good. <laughs> All right. Okay, so these are the values that we need. We need the 7.55 for our mean, the 0 0.10274 for the standard deviation, and then this is our T value that we need. All right, so let's go back over to Notepad then so I can actually write down what the test is supposed to be. So in this problem, our null hypothesis is that the mean is 7.5 and our alternative hypothesis is that the mean is different from 7.5. In this particular problem it actually says test against a two-sided alternative. That's how I know it was not equal to. So you actually use the word two-sided alternative as opposed to a one tail or a one sided alternative. All right, so we got, now of course I've already forgotten what the Excel value was. Two point, what was it? Let me write it down. 2.26. All right, so since it's a, since it's a two sided alternative hypothesis and we're using alpha as 0.05, I know that this is 0.025 over here, and this is 0.025 over here, right? We split the, we split our 0.05 into two pieces. 
We agree? So for our critical region, we'll reject if our T statistic is great. Um, I'll do absolute value just so I can write it in one statement. If our absolute value of T is greater than the 2.26, so if we're above 2.26 or below negative 2.26, we'll reject. That gives us our critical region. And then if we calculate our test statistic, we're going to calculate it just like we did for means, or for, I'm sorry, for large sample or if we're given the variance. We're going to take our X bar, subtract our mu, now, when we did it for, well, we did the example last time, I wrote down sigma here because we were given the variance. But in this case, we're not given the variance, so what do we use as a point estimator for our variance, or sorry, our standard deviation if we're not given the standard deviation? The sample one, right? So we'll use S over square root of N. So the test statistic for T is the same as the test statistic for Z. We just use one for large sample or known variance versus small sample unknown variance. It's the same exact test statistic though. So in this case, the X bar was 7.55 and this was 7.5. That's our, that's our uh, presumed mean, right? Okay. And then our standard deviation was 0 0.10 something. 10274. Okay, good. And then the ends 10. Okay. So might as well hop back over to Excel here and do this. Or take Sam's word for it. One or two. I think Sam's kind of sketchy. I'm not sure Jake should take his word for it. <laughs> I know Michael's sketchy. I'd never take his word for it. Because <laughs> I'm not going to tell. Because uh, I'm not going to listen to it anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, seven point five five minus seven point five divided by standard deviation over the square root of ten. One point five four. Yeah. Yay. All right, so about 1.538. So what do we say? Yeah, good. And again, I don't really care if you write a big long conclusion statement. I'll save that for Dr. Lee. Yes, Sam. Are we going to do p-values in this class? We can do a p-value for this one, so why not? We can do that. How would we do a p-value in this case? Might as well do it, since we have the technology. And I would I would make a joke, but that would really date how old I am. If you're familiar with old 80s shows, there was a $6 million man. And he, had got, he was a test pilot and got severely injured in a crash and they were like we can rebuild him we have the technology <laughs> it was <laughs> it's fine don't worry about it <laughs> all right if we want the probability associated with a particular value we would do the inverse actually I should do one minus this because I want above this value Oops. All right, equals one minus. I do t dot inverse. I could actually do the two tail, but I want to show this for um, just the one tail and tell you what we have to do. Oops, that's not what I want to do. I don't want inverse. Try this again. T dot distribution. That's what I want. Oh, I have a right tail. There. You know what? I'm just going to mess this all the way up. Let's just go ahead and go to right tail, so I don't have to retype it. Sorry. My apologies. I want the probability associated with this value on the right tail. I apologize. The value that I want is what's at A15, and the degrees of freedom is 9. 
So again, what this represents is the probability that another sample would give you a value at least this far away from the mean, at least 1.358 p values away from the mean, I should say. Not quite standard deviation, but. So you're going to agree with still nine. Now, this, this is not the p-value for this test, though. This would be the p-value for a one-tailed test. If this were a one-tailed test, this is how you would calculate the p-value. This would give you the probability that you're another random sample, assuming the null hypothesis is true, this is the probability that the random sample would give you another value at least this far away, with at least this big of a test statistic. However, we're doing this for a t, a two-tailed test, right? So if I want at least this far away, I need to check the other side too, the negative, which would have the same probability. So I would need to multiply that value by two. And this is what the, the p-value is. I am having issues typing today. All right. It's just is the first one times, it's the A16 times two. This one? It's just, it's just that times two. So again, the, the reasoning behind that is, let me go back and draw a picture. The reasoning behind this is, uh, we found this test statistic at 1.538, right? We're trying to calculate the probability that another test statistic calculated from another sample would be at least this bad or maybe worse, okay? So what we calculated first was this probability. This was the 0 0.079, was that the other decimal? Whatever it was, doesn't really matter. But remember, this is a two-tailed test. So there's another tail down here that it could also land in and be that bad, right? Because for this test statistic, we look at the absolute value of the T value to give us whether or not it's far enough away. So that's why we have to double it. I think it was a nine, but I'll go back over to Excel and check it. That's why we have to double it in this case. Yeah. <sighs> okay. All right, or if you wanted to use, uh, the reason why I did it was to illustrate the difference in the tails. You could have just done the t.distribution.2-tail. And if I take the test statistic and the degrees of freedom, I get the same value. It would do, it would do the doubling for you in the command. The reason why I wanted to do it the other way was to give you the concept of what's going on. Again, we're trying to calculate that another, assuming the null hypothesis is true, we want to calculate the probability of finding another sample that's at least this bad. For a two-tailed test, at least this bad means I could be below as well as above. That's why I have to double it. Because it could be in the top tail or it could be in the bottom tail. Does that make sense? So it's at least that test statistic. It's at least that test statistic far away from what zero would be. So the, the mean of the sample is at least as far away as the 7.55. That's the idea. So you can you can compare your p value to your alpha value as another way to determine whether or not you would reject. If your p value is greater than alpha, you don't reject. If it's less less than alpha, you do reject. The reason for that again is because if your test statistics not in your critical region there's going to be more probability in that tail than what should be in your critical region tail. So you don't reject. If, you're, if your test statistic is in the critical region, there's less in that tail beyond the test statistic than there is beyond the critical value. So the probability should be smaller. Can you say that one more time? If your p-value is greater than alpha, you reject? You do not reject. If your p-value is greater, you do not reject. And the reason for that is here, this p-value here, you know, remember our test statistic was over here, right? 
So this was this was giving us 0 0.025 here and 0 0.025 over here. So the p-value is going to be bigger than the alpha. So, and we did not reject because we didn't land in our critical region. That's the idea for the picture. Is this okay? So anything that's, again, if you've got large sample or if you're given the variance, you use a Z to figure out your critical value in your critical region. If you have a small sample and unknown variance, you use P, just like we did before for confidence intervals. It's the same idea. But the test, you calculate the test statistic in exactly the same way. The only thing that changes is how do you find the critical value. But again, we find the critical value the same way we found the critical value in the confidence interval. It's the exact same thing. Right? It's that value we had out in front of the standard deviation piece. It's exactly the same idea. That's okay? So we can do the same thing for, oh, yeah, I guess it probably is running low since I haven't plugged it in for a while. So we can do the same idea for differences of means. So let's do an example of that. So again, the whole idea for calculating a test statistic is knowing what the standard deviation piece looks like. So remember when we started the, the process with um, T values, where did I put my glasses? Right there. When we started the process with T values, we had that idea of the assumption that we had to have equal variances. And so we pooled the variance. Right? Or if we had large samples, we just did the individual variances and added them together for the different pieces, right? So when we do this, let's just do an example or two. So let's say we had this one is, well, let's just do the very first problem. So we've got, we want to test our null hypothesis is that the mean of x's is equal to the mean of the y's. And we're going to test that against that the mean of the x is actually less than the mean of the y's. This is 7.3. Sorry. They uh, tell us to assume that they're both normal. They might have different means, but we're going to make the assumption that the variances are the same. So that was how the problem actually writes the distribution for x and y. Okay. So when we did this uh, back in confidence intervals, if we had small samples, so in this particular problem, our samples for n and m, so this is our, the number that we choose, chose from x is the number we chose from y, they're both going to be 10. When we did this for small samples, what did our standard deviation piece look like? What did the, in the margin of error piece look like? What did we have to do? If we did the standard deviation for uh, the difference of the means. If we, that's if we had uh, if we knew the variance and didn't know that they were equal, but we're going to have to use point estimates in this case, right? Because we're not going to, I, we weren't given what the variance is. So we had to use point estimates, but we're assuming that they're equal. What did we use? The pooled idea, right? Right? So we had the square root of our sp squared times 1 over n plus 1 over m. 
right? So this is actually an estimate. We're using a particular estimate for this, right? Remember we're doing that for our confidence intervals? Okay. So from this, how do you think we're going to develop a test statistic? What do you think we're going to do? Okay, so it's going to look something like the confidence interval idea, right? When we had the confidence interval, we know we had the x bar minus y bar plus or minus that t sub alpha over 2, and then this, this piece, right? That's, I'm just writing it off to the side because that's what our confidence interval looked like, yes? Okay. So if we're going to do this hypothesis test, what do you think we're going to do? Okay, so we'll probably do a, a t statistic because this is small samples, yes? We'll do our mean of x minus mean of y. Do I need to subtract anything off of that? Well, well, I'm asking this because remember in one mean we did x bar minus mu, correct? Now why did we do x bar minus mu? What does that part do? Conceptually, what does that part do? It makes it standard. Which part standard? The mean or the standard deviation part? What does it make it standard? The mean part, right? What's it changing the mean to? Zero, right? It's doing the standard normal, correct? It's making the mean zero by doing that part, okay? Now remember, when we're doing hypothesis testing, we will always just start with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, okay? What is the mean of the distribution x minus y if we assume the null hypothesis is true? What, do we, what is the mean of x minus y? Zero. So do we need to subtract anything off of x bar minus y bar? No. Okay. There's nothing to subtract off of this because we're assuming they're equal. Yes, Sam? You would be, you'd have to make an assumption that their difference was in a specific value, and then you would subtract that specific value off. Correct. <laughs> All right. And then, what do, we what do you think we need to divide by? In the previous, we divided by the standard deviation, correct? Well, this is now our formula that we have for the standard deviation, isn't it? This piece, just this piece right here? Yeah. You divide by that. Well, this, I don't need to, the, the 1 over n plus 1 over m is taking care of that part. So, that's all we need to divide by. Can you tell me one more time that, um, the pool variance? Yep, sure can. Remember the pool variance is a weighted average. So we would do n minus 1 of the sample standard deviation for x, m minus 1 standard deviation for y, and then divide by the n plus m minus 2. Yeah, Michael. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll calculate it. I actually gave this data in this particular problem, so we'll calculate it in a minute. But yeah, that's exactly right. So there's one more piece that we also need to worry about. We just developed the test statistic. We need to worry about the critical region. Now remember, for confidence interval, this was always alpha over 2. The confidence interval always had two tails, correct? But we did do some confidence intervals that had one tail, and we changed that to an alpha. This particular test is also a one-tailed test, right? So we want, and we also want to know if the mean for x is less than the mean for y. So we need to go over here, don't we? And look for this tail. So how are we going to figure out what this t value is? What do we need to do? If alpha is 0.05, let's just assume that's our value. How are we going to figure out what this t value is? Okay, and then how many uh, degrees of freedom do we need? Yeah, so in this case it'll be 18, 
right? And I'll need to do, well, if I do it, actually type it in as t.inverse, it'll give me the negative in this case. So let's go over to Excel and get some values then. That sounds like fun. All right, so there it is. All right, so I'll get that t, that critical t value first. Let me zoom in because it's, it's next to impossible to see here. All right, so we do the t dot inverse. The probability if I do 0 0.05, that's actually the left tail, right? Because there's always cumulative probability, and we had 18 degrees of freedom. So you have the negative 1.734. Or just ahead of me, one of the two. <laughs> so when we calculate our test statistic, this is a this is a one-tailed test, and we're on the left side. So we we will reject if t the test statistic is less than one point seven three four negative one point seven three four. We need to be the left of that. All right, and I need to give you some t data now for this problem, so we can actually calculate some stuff. <clears throat> the x values they gave you were 2.1, 2.6, a couple of times. Uh, where did the 2.1 go? 2.1, 3.4, 2.1, and 1.7. Oh, whoops. What did I do? Apparently I deleted my t value. It wasn't very cool. It's not a bit good typing day today. All right, there's that. Where am I at? 1.7, 2.6, 2.6. I don't know why it's not moving down when I hit the enter key on me. I don't know what that's, going, what that's about. All right, 1.2. Those are your X's. Those are your values for X. Here are the ones for Y. All right, so I need the means. So this is from A2 to A11. No, I did. Uh, this thing is not registering what I'm hitting. <laughs> it's irritating me. B L. I could have just copied and pasted. Dot dot B eleven. That's how I learned it when I learned spreadsheets back, you know, back in the '80s. So it was do a double dot would give you the range. So that's why I've always used because it's what I learned. Uh, and uh, apparently today it doesn't want to register at the second period. Or just really wants to irritate me, which it's succeeding. All right, we need pool. So these are the means. Can I label the columns and just leave it leave it as means? Would that be okay? What are you, what are you asking me? To, the, the, this one, this one's the x bar, and that's what y bar. Yep. That's what you're asking me? Sorry. All right, so I need the variances because i got to pool them, right? So I need the variances rather than the standard. I mean, I could use the standard deviations, but I'll just have to square them. A2 dot dot A11. Okay. So those are the sample variances. So this is your SX squared, SY squared. So I've got to pool this stuff. So I need to do nine times the first one. So I could just do the first one plus the second one divided by two by the time I factor things out. But just to remember the formula, nine times the second one and then divided by 18. Right, I could have just added them together and divided by two because I could have canceled nines. But just to remember the formula. 
So this is your pooled variance. Everybody okay with those and how we calculate them? Okay. So now your test statistic is the difference of your sample means. So in this case, it's A12 minus B12. And I need to divide by that standard deviation piece, which is going to be the square root of our pooled variance. And then multiplied by the reciprocals of the sample size. And I could, again, I could have just typed in two-fifths. Because that's what a tenth plus a tenth is. Or, I'm sorry, not two-fifths, a fifth. Two-tenths. Just to uh, illustrate the formula again, so... This is the numerator of your test statistic, your x bar minus your y bar, pool variance times the sum of the reciprocals. We show the formula in there. Is okay? So we hit enter. So we'll then add it in. Don't be such a jerk. You do it any other time. <laughs> this is our test statistic. All right. Our critical value is up there at the top. And there's our test statistic. So do we reject or not reject? We reject. Good. Is okay? <coughs> Any questions on that one? Now remember, when we use the pooled variance idea, we're assuming that the variances are equal, right? If the variances are, if it's thought that the variances may not be equal, then you want to go back to just Sample variance over N, sample variance over M for your standard deviation piece. Okay, just to write this down. Go back over here. If the variance for the X's is not the same as the variance for Y's, then we use the square root of SX squared over N plus SY squared over M for the standard deviation. That's an A. <laughs> now, we have to be a little careful with our T though. We mentioned this before. We don't want to pool the variances because we, when we pool the variances, we're making the assumption that the variances are equal. If we don't know that the variances are equal, then we use the individual pieces for the variances like we would in large sample cases, right? Our individual estimates in the large sample case. But... We also use what's referred to as Welch's degree of freedom for the T distribution. And this degrees of freedom, whoops, forgot the word freedom. For a lot of words. And this is on page 295. All right, so the idea behind this, and we're not going to go through into a lot of the specifics, and I'm not going to make you memorize this formula. It was not fun. And I mentioned this before when we talked about this. But the reason why we're able to get the degrees of freedom that we do for the t value that we look up 
is because when we make the assumption that the variances are equal, we can manipulate that formula to give us the chi-squared distribution that we need. The, S, the Sx squared times n minus one over sigma squared will give us chi-squared for n minus one, right? That's, our for, that's how we came up with the distribution for the variances, right? M minus one Sy squared over sigma squared gives you chi-squared of n minus two, or n, m minus one I mean. And when you add independent chi squares, you get independent chi, or get a chi squared, and you add the degrees of freedom. Right? We've talked about all this distribution stuff, right? So when you add n minus one and m minus one, you get n plus m minus two, and we have to divide out the degrees of freedom when we do that, right? So that's where that pool variance idea comes from. It's from that n minus one. Sx squared to get the chi squared of n minus 1, and m minus 1 Sy squared to give you chi squared of m minus 1, and then divide out by its degrees of freedom. That's where the n plus m minus 2 comes from. So that's why we look up the t value for n plus m minus 2. Now again, though, to get all of the whole point of that, lots of words and me not writing anything down and waving my hands, the whole point of all of that was the assumption we had to make before we did any of that, was that the variances are equal, right? If they're not equal, then I don't want to pool the variances because pooling the variance idea is to give you a better estimate for the variance, the overall variance, putting the two pieces together. So we don't want to do that if they're not equal. That's why we just use this usual formula that we would use if we had large samples, right? However, we lose a lot of information when we do this, right? Because we are trying to make inferences from small samples. So to balance that out, we require a bigger p-value from our test statistic to be able to reject. Now we know that if we lower the degrees of freedom, the p-values get bigger, right? Because the distribution gets wider, the smaller the degrees of freedom get, get the higher variance. So, this mathematician Welch came up with this formula that lowers your degrees of freedom in this case. Okay, I'm going to write the formula down just so that you've seen it once. If you ever need it, you can ref for a homework problem, you can refer to it in the book. Okay, but I'm never going to make you memorize this. All right. So you would use the floor function of R. Floor means truncate. So if you've got 2.6, you would drop it to 2. Just drop off any decimal that you see. That's what the floor function means. It's also the greatest integer function. Okay. Here's the formula. You ready? It's a fun formula. This is one of those, if you ever need the formula, you look it up. Oh, yeah, I need the other one squared, too. Thanks. This is why I don't want to make you memorize it. It's not, you're not going to use it hardly at all, and it's a really nice formula. This is what you use for your degrees of freedom. So then your... The critical value you want is either your t sub alpha of r or t sub alpha over 2 of r, depending if you're doing a one tail or a two tailed test. Yes, Sam? This value will, is always going to be lower than n plus n minus 2. So that's how it lowers the degree of freedom. You can show that it's, it's always going to be smaller than that. No. Well, at least not that I know of. There might be. I shouldn't say no. I should say I don't know. 
So you would calculate this value, most likely not going to be an integer, so you drop off the decimal part. That's what you use for your degrees of freedom. And then look up your p-value. So in our case, see what this r value would be in our case for the, what we just did. So let's switch back over to Excel here. So we already have um, our variances. So that would be our numerator. That part would be our numerator, yes? Okay. So the denominator then would be one ninth times um, variance over 10 squared, and then plus, I don't know why I put a parenthesis around there, another one ninth times variance over 10 squared. All right, that was the one over n minus one times variance over, sample variance for x over a number of uh, things in your sample squared and the same thing here. And then I need to take, it's interesting. Hmm. I guess not always. Mm -hmm. that, oops, G14, wherever I am. F13, oh, I forgot something in the formula, crap. That's the problem. The numerator also needs to be squared. <laughs> Sorry. The whole thing. Yep, the numerator is squared as well. Sorry. I told you if I have a bad day. Squared. Okay. So this is going to be F13 divided by F14. So you would use 17 degrees of freedom here instead of 18. The reason why it's close in this case is because the variance, the sample variances are pretty close together. So we only lost a, a degree of freedom using this formula. It'll be much more pronounced if you've got sample variances that are farther away. All right, so we'll go back over here. This formula should be a squared on top. Sorry about that. This is why I said I'm not going to make you memorize it. There's a lot of pieces to it. <laughs> yeah. So we wouldn't use the 17 if we knew that the variance If we had reason to suspect that they were not equal, we would use 17. Yeah. One of those reasons might be that they're really, really far apart because they're really just not that far apart. And because they're not that far apart, they really need to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice if you change the one degree of freedom, it's not going to change your critical value by much. So if I go back over here and change our critical, our degrees of freedom here to 17 instead of 18, it just didn't change the t value much. And again, we wouldn't expect it to because those variances just aren't that far apart. Now, if I went here and forced one of these to be like two, notice it dropped it significantly. Then in that case, we do see that from a relative standpoint, they really are pretty far apart. So that we would use this if we suspect that they're pretty far apart. But again, even at this point, if I use a degree of freedom of 12, well, now this, the test statistic is messed up here because I still have pooled variances. But if I go back up here to 12, my critical value still isn't all that much bigger. So if, I, my, te if my test statistic were still as big as it was before, then it wouldn't be changing that much. But again, our test, ta our test statistic changes in that point too, because I wouldn't use this one anymore. I would use, I would use the variance here divided by 10 and the variance here divided by 10. 
I wouldn't pull it, so it would change that. But in, in this case, I wouldn't reject. But not really because they changed the degrees of freedom so much as it changed what the statistic compute computation was. The reason for this, the reason why, if you look at the reasoning behind why we wouldn't reject, now notice from the sample, the Y's look, well, I mean, just from first glance, that looks pretty significant in the difference, doesn't it? But the variance here is so high, whereas this variance is so low, you could see that you could get another sample, or this one would be lower than that one, or at least much closer. Right? This one's not, this one we don't expect to vary too much, but this one's going to vary by significantly more. Right? Mm -hmm. So we could imagine a scenario where we pick another set of another set of samples and have it be the other way around, which is why we can't reject. In this case. Which makes sense, right? If you got one of them has a much higher variance than the other. Well, then, may, and, and the means are relatively close enough, then you could see where they could flip flop in a different sample. Does that make sense? Okay. This is the stuff that you're going to do in 7.3. Okay. So it's just a matter of picking the right formula. The concept of doing the hypothesis testing doesn't change ever. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about section 7.4, we'll do it for variances. We'll change the test statistic, but the concept is going to be the same. Because for variances, we'll need to go and do chi-squared rather than normal, or t. Say that again? So, the, the, so this, was saying, this is for small size. And if you've got a large sample, you would use uh, Square root of e would be and you oh. and then you're you be comparing it with the v value, but it will be the same without yeah. without the variance. Oh, that's the variance. If the variance is the same, then you have to do that different uh, degrees of freedom thing, and then you use this to be compared. Okay.